This is an electric tankless water heater. I've been dealing with electric and gas tankless water heaters for over 15 years. I'm going to show you in this video everything you need to know about an electric tankless water heater specifically. So hit that subscribe button down there. Check this out. I've got a ton of questions about electric tankless and I haven't done a video on them yet. So this is going to hopefully help some of you guys decide on whether or not electric tankless water heater is right for you. Hit that subscribe button before you forget about it and we'll get right into this thing. All right, first of all, this is a Cisco 32KW mock-up unit. It has a clear front cover on it. All the components are actual components, so I can show you that. There's Cisco, there's Steinwell Tron, there's Emacs, there's a bunch of manufacturers. They all work similar, but also a little bit differently, and that matters as to how happy you're going to be with the product. You want some of the ones with the most advanced technology. I'm going to explain all of that to you. All right, these things work based on flow. Now, so do the gas tankless water heaters, right? But there's a big difference. Some of these water heaters, and this is one of them, does not control your flow. In the world of tankless, guys, if you can't control flow, you can't control the outlet water temperature. In other words, you can overshoot the product. If this water heater is able to give you three gallons a minute, let's say, at a 50 degree temperature rise, we're going to come back to that, and you flow seven gallons a minute, and you're asking it to raise the temperature 50 degrees, it can't do that. So you'll get your seven gallons a minute, but you will not get your 50 degree temperature rise. It's gonna be somewhere lower on the curve. And what does that mean? It means if you're in the shower and you're flowing about two gallons a minute, and it's winter time, you're up in the northern tier state or a middle tier state, I'm in Virginia, and everything's great. I'm having a shower, good hot water. Someone turns on the tub spout at three, three and a half gallons a minute, I'm going to get ready to get a great big surprise because the water temperature is going to go because the water heater can't keep up and I'm not controlling the flow. So you need to understand some of these things. Um, Stable Eltron actually has a unit out now, from what I understand, that controls flow. I hope Cisco eventually will too, but if you're going to get an electric tankless and you're not in one of the southernmost tier states down south, you want one that can control flow. That's very, very important. I mentioned temperature rise. All tankless water heaters work on flow and temperature rise. In Virginia where I'm at, our average water temperature is about 60 degrees in central Virginia. Now it gets colder this time of year, it's actually January, uh, almost February, the water is as cold as it's going to get. On public water it's probably 50 degrees. So if I'm asking this water heater to take 50 degree water to 120 degree water, that's a 70 degree temperature rise. All tankless water heaters have a chart, most of them publish it, that'll tell you at a given temperature rise how much flow you can get out of the machine and maintain that temperature. Well, this water heater right here, 32KW, uh, and I'm gonna guess I don't have it right in front of me, but it's pretty close, you can look this up yourself. At a 70 degree rise, that water heater's gonna do about two and a half gallons a minute, one shower at a time. So, we call them whole house water heaters one shower at a time, dead of winter. Summertime, public water temperatures can get as high as, believe it or not, 70 or 80 degrees. So now my temperature rise is gonna be a lot smaller, and I can run a couple showers at, a, at the same time with one of these units, no problem. So a lot of this depends on your own personal needs, where you are in the country. If you're in a northern tier state, these probably are not the best solution for you. You really should consider a gas one. Gas ones are my favorite anyway. But hopefully that helps you understand how the whole temperature rise thing works. If you're in Florida and your water's 80 degrees coming in all the time and you want to set this thing for, say, 110, you don't need 120 degree of water. You can't shower at 120. You can't shower at 110. But if you got 80 degrees coming in, 110 going out, that's only a 30 degree rise. This thing will run three or four showers at the same time like that, especially today's low flow stuff. So that's what's all about temperature rise for tankless water heaters. So we got the temperature rise and the flow out of the way, mostly. Uh, just to touch base real quick, your average shower head is about two and a half gallons a minute, rated at 80 PSI. All right, so you don't have 80 PSI in your house. Most of you don't. You have probably 60, so you don't have two and a half gallons a minute. You're real lucky if you're flowing about a gallon and a half to maybe a gallon and three quarters out of a standard shower head. Most of that is going to be hot water, but not all of it. We use about an 80% rule. So in reality, with a tankless water heater to run a shower, I really only need to provide you about a gallon, a gallon and a half a minute per shower head flow, and you'll be very happy with it. 
So that's kind of the rest of the story on flow. Now let's talk about something very important for electric tankless, the amp draw, the KW. If you're replacing a standard 50 gallon tank water heater, that uses a 30 amp circuit. None of the electric tankless water heaters are going to be whole house with a 30 amp circuit. Zero of them. Very important for you to understand. You're going to have to upgrade the electrical service or run a new electrical service to wherever this product's going to be mounted. You don't just unhook your wires from the tank, screw this dude to the wall, hook the wires back in. Guys, it won't work. You're going to have to run new wires. They're going to be much bigger wires. What size wires? It depends on the unit you choose. This one uses a number six gauge copper wire all the way back to your breaker panel and it's going to need a couple of 70 amp breakers, okay? Now, if you need to ask a guy on YouTube what size breakers and what size wire, you probably shouldn't be doing this stuff yourself. You need to be hiring somebody, which I always recommend anyway if you've watched any of my other videos. So, about electric tankless water heaters, much, much higher amp draw, much bigger wires, much bigger breakers. Can your panel handle it? That's the next thing we're going to talk about. This is a standard 200 amp service panel for a house. My house, of course, but they're all pretty similar. Now, a lot of people think that you add up all the breakers, all the breaker numbers, and when you get to 200 amps, you're done. You can't do anything else in that panel. Guys, that's not how this works. There's a diversity factor in a house. Your electrician can tell you if your panel can handle the service load of an electric tankless. And remember, you're going to be pulling out a 30 amp double pole breaker, which is where you're going to be putting in your new higher amp breakers. So you're going to lose 30 amps out of the panel going in. This is a question for your electrician. Again, I'm sorry, not a guy on YouTube. It's way too important that this be correct. But don't think because you have a 200 amp panel and all your numbers add up to too close to 200 that you can't do an electric tankless. You most certainly can. Whether you want to or not is what we're trying to help you determine here. So hopefully that answered some questions uh, about your panel capacity. Now let's talk about the components in the heater so you can understand how this machine works. In this machine you have four chambers. There are machines with two chambers and one chamber even. This one has four. In it there are four elements at the top. One, two, three, four. These are very similar to the elements that are in your regular tank water heater but again a much higher output. Now every one of these machines uh, by manufacturer is going to fire them slightly different. We'll talk about that in a second. There are thermistors in there. These little white wires are thermistors. There's five or six of them in here. You have a control board that handles everything, distributing the power and handling the power load. And that's really about it. The chambers, the elements, the board, the sensors. Inlet on one side over here, outlet on the other side over there. So not too difficult to machine, but what makes them different? Stiebel, Altron, and Cisco both have done something that most of the others don't do. First, let's talk about the others. Your Emacs brand, uh, unless they've made any changes, and quite a few of the others, and their four chambers, when it senses flow, whether it be by a flow switch or a temperature sensor, it'll fire one element at whatever that element's maximum amps are. Let's say that that's 30 amps. Boom! That element comes on at 30 amps. It gets overheated, it turns the element off. When the temperature drops, it turns the element back on, and it bounces that element on, off, on, off, on, off to maintain a low flow across the machine. Then when flow stops, element turns off, and you're sitting still. Well, that's not bad, but when you slam this thing on at 30 amps on a low flow, or if this one's not enough and it slams the next one on at 30 amps, and so on and so on, bouncing these elements on and off at full power is a tremendous drain on your meter. It's going to affect your bill a lot. Uh, still probably less than the tank because there's no standby losses. The machine is off, but it's still going to be a lot harder hit to your panel and a lot harder hit to your wallet. What Cisco and Stiebel Eltron do, when they sense flow, they'll bring the first element on at about one amp of power and then slowly ramp it up from there. Just like turning the dial on a, on a light fixture, a dimmer switch. Each one of these elements has a modulating control that fires the element based on what the needs are of the machine at that time. Up to its max, then it brings on the next one, up to its max, brings on the next one, up to its max. It's kind of oversimplified, but that's how the machine works, which means lower amp draw, which means lower energy bill, and much better temperature control over the unit. One other thing that matters a lot when you're doing it that way, 
when these things cycle off, when flow stops, there's still heat in the machine. And little micro bubbles are bubbling up. And they'll get trapped, typically, in the first element chamber. Now, on most models, that element is going to be the one that burns out. Because you build up a little air pocket in there, you end up dry firing the element, and it pops, burns out very quickly. Uh, Stiebel Eltron, Cisco, they have a vented chamber all the way across. Little micro bubbles find their way to the outlet. You don't have that problem. It's a much more durable design. So that's basically how the machines work. The good and the bad. The better ones modulate the power. The not so better ones and cheaper ones are going to slam the elements on and off, on and off. Make sense? Okay, so we've talked about how they function, what the components are, how they work, what kind of panel load you may need. We've talked about a lot of that flow, some sizing kind of things. The big question I get all the time is, do electric tankless water heaters work? Guys, the answer is yes and no. It depends on where you are. It depends on what your water temperature rise needs are. Up north, probably not so much. Middle tier states, big fat maybe. They're great for condos and apartments. They're great for smaller homes, one or two bath. Bigger homes, guys, when you see some of these tankless manufacturers that show their flow chart and show pictures of shower heads, and they're showing five and six shower heads on one of these water heaters, <laughs> run, all right? That's bull. They will not do it. I hate to say it, but uh, you know what? Some manufacturers will tell you just about anything to sell their widget. It's not what we do here. All right? Doesn't mean it's, it's a piece of junk. Doesn't mean it won't work in your application. But don't think you're going to take a 32KW water heater and do a six-bath home. It's just not going to happen. You know what? Maybe Arizona, uh, in some of the desert climates where you've got 90-degree water coming in, which you don't really need much of a water heater anyway for that. Maybe. But the reality for most of us is, yes, properly sized for the application, these machines can work, and they can work very well. I encourage you to get a good one. If you're going to buy it off the Internet, you better do your homework. Make sure you get the brand name where the company's going to stand behind it and having it installed by a licensed contractor. I know I catch a lot of grief for sending people to licensed contractors in some of my other videos, but I'm telling you, that's the way it's going to work best, okay? So, yes, they absolutely can work. Now... Where are they really not going to work? The first place these things are really not going to work well is on a well. Why? Because you're going to have 45 degree water round numbers coming into your home. And you're going to be asking this machine to do a whole lot of work. Now if you have a one bath house on a well, fine. It'll probably work. But chances are that house has an electrical panel that's too small to support the right size machine because your water is so cold going in. So, I'm not saying it won't work, but you need to really do your homework on it to make sure it will. I do answer questions as best that I can. Uh, please don't ask me to look up every freaking unit you can find on Google. I get those questions all the time. If I'm familiar with it, I'll help you. But if I'm not, you need to contact the manufacturer and have them answer the questions and then verify it with your local contractors. Because, like I told you, some of them show crap that it just won't do. Another place that they're going to have problems is very large... Uh, flow swings. If you're in a home that's very busy and you have high flow fixtures like body sprays or large tub fillers, you probably don't want an electric tank. Let's stick with the gas. I have other gas tankless water heater videos on my channel too. You can check those out. Those are places where I would stay away from the electrics. Now, where do they really shine? Where do they do a great job? I'm going to tell you. Small homes, small apartments, average apartments, condos. Places where you have a low flow fixture, you have a lot of uh, water filter restrictions or restrictors, aerators that cut the flow way down, these things will do super, they'll do great. Most of those are doing less than a gallon a minute of fixture anyway, okay? Another place they do really good is radiant heat, hydronic radiant floor heat. Because I don't have to worry quite so much about temperature control, there's always going to be a mixing device between the water heater and the slab or the floor. These things do a great job as a radiant heat source and they can be very very inexpensive as compared to a boiler for that so if you're just doing a kitchen floor or a garage floor one of these on the wall is the perfect choice and a great place to have one alright so hopefully that was short sweet to the point and you guys understand a lot more about how these electric tankless water heaters work and where they don't to help you make a decision on whether or not that's right for you 
Check out the notes that have been flashing around throughout this video. I usually put some in because I forgot to say something. Make sure you hit that subscribe button over there. And check out some other tankless water heater videos that are on this channel. We'll see you next time.